Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome this panel, very important panel uh, of expertise on the Gulf and uh, with uh, a forward-looking, uh, not only analysis of what is taking place, but also what to do about it. And I have the honor of uh, this great panel. Uh, they agreed that they would each would come in with what two three minutes introductory remarks on regarding what they really are bringing to the table. That's what I will do first. I will go down the line here. Then I will engage them in question answer, maybe individually at the beginning, and then engage the others. So if you see me focusing on one person first, and then uh, the second and the third. One after the other, so do not worry. I'm not ignoring or underestimating any of my esteemed panelists. <laughs> With that, I'd like to give the floor to Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, uh, who is Middle East Inst Institute Senior Vice President, former U.S. Department of State and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, and former U.S. Ambassador to Yemen. So I guess the floor is yours, and I assume you're going to start with Yemen. Please, sir. Thank you, Raghida, and uh, and indeed, I, I will start with Yemen. Uh, uh, just you know, kind of to, to hit the wave tops uh, very briefly, and we can uh, certainly follow up with more detail. And and uh, within the context of this panel discussion, uh, geopolitical dynamics of Arabia and the Gulf, I uh, just wanted to make a few points. One, uh, to begin with a caveat, and that is to say that. Uh, in my view, the, uh, the conflict in Yemen is primarily a civil conflict. It is not a regional conflict. Uh, it's not a proxy war. It is a war among Yemenis, uh, and it's uh, part of something that's been going on for, for many, many years, many decades, in fact. So, but within that, within that broad understanding of, the, of the, the real drivers of the conflict, there are, um, I think two regional dynamics that we uh, absolutely have to address in our understanding of the conflict and our understanding of how to resolve and move forward. And the first is the one that people mostly focus on, and that is the competition particularly between Iran and Saudi Arabia or between Iran and the broader uh, GCC states, including uh, the UAE and uh, Bahrain. Uh, and, and of course, uh, that, again, is, is focused on what I would say is primarily the uh, mirror images that the, two, that the two rival powers have of their security situation, uh, their strategic situation, and the, and the particular fear that the Saudis have of being encircled by hostile powers uh, loyal or, or associated with Iran. And, uh, and the, the, the perception that they would have that Yemen fits within that, uh, that policy of encirclement uh, that the Iranians have been pursuing. So that's the, the one aspect of regional uh, dynamic. The other one that I think is relatively newer and in many ways uh, perhaps more concerning, and that is the extent to which Yemen has become an arena for competition in the broader uh, battle for dominance of the Red Sea littoral. And so uh, looking at Yemen, uh, not only um, in its position in the Arabian Peninsula, but um, uh, as part of the broader Horn of Africa um, uh, competition that's going on uh, between, say, Saudi Arabia and the UAE on one hand, Qatar and Turkey on another, uh, on the other, but even within the alliances between Saudi Arabia and um, uh, and the Emirates, and so, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that is going on, and, and I think that, you know, the request was that we we kind of talk a little bit about how to move forward, and, and what the uh, what the the, uh, the the resolutions of these conflicts may be, um, on the on the Iran Saudi one, the Iran Gulf one. Uh, what I would say is that we have actually come. Uh, perhaps to a more hopeful moment uh, in terms of the possibilities that uh, we may get into a, a period of de-escalating tensions um, uh, between the Iranians and the GCC states, uh, triggered partially because of, of the growing uh, skepticism in the in the Gulf about the reliability of the U.S. security umbrella, um, but uh, but also. 
uh, because there is an understanding that a conflict between Iran and the GCC states would be incredibly destructive and not in anybody's interest. And so we are getting into a place where, uh, where there is a, an opportunity now to really try to push through on that, uh, reduce tensions, and the United States can and should uh, be trying to play a, a positive role in doing that. Um, I think by, by in some way facilitating a conversation with the Iranians that would include uh, perhaps some relief on sanctions. So, uh, so that's one point. On the, on the issue of the broader um, regional conflict in the, in the Red Sea, I think that, that similarly the international community has a role to play on uh, helping to, uh, to fence off Yemen from that kind of a competition and to re reinforce the basic perspective and the, and the international community position as reflected in uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2216 uh, that in fact the international community sees um, uh, that Yemen, uh, the solution to Yemen has to be uh, the, uh, the existence of a unified sovereign uh, Yemen capable of exercising um, uh, territorial control. And then the third element, uh, the third recommendation would be um, the role of the international community in terms of helping the Yemenis build the institutions that would allow them uh, to exercise that sovereignty and to, uh, and to make clear uh, that they have the capacity to keep um, uh, from falling into the trap of being a battleground in, in regional competition. And so let me stop there. I, excellent, fascinating. Can I just take up a couple of points with you? Of course. Uh, did, let, obviously everybody believes, or hopefully everybody believes, that this war in Yemen must end one way or another. And there are different players to, who have the responsibility to end it. But then there's a misconception about why is this war taking place? Why did it erupt? I didn't hear you say anything about you know, the security of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia as a, an initial reason for this war, that they feel that they were attacked, basically, and that they had to look after their national security. I didn't hear you mention any such thing. Is it because you don't believe it, or you forgot to say it? Well, again, I, I think that the important thing to understand about the Yemen conflict is that the Yemen conflict started because of issues that are internal to Yemen. It didn't start because of um, Saudi Arabia or any other external power. And this is a conflict that's been going on, in my view, for about 60 years. So, so to understand Yemen, you need to understand that internal, uh, that internal context of, of the conflict. But having said that, you're, you're absolutely right in the sense, and I tried to make this point, of, of Saudi Arabia's concern, its perception, strategic perception, that Iran has been engaged in an effort to encircle um, Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula with a ring of hostile powers, and that Yemen, is the, is the last link in that chain of hostility. So if yeah. you look at the situation in September of 2014 when the Houthis entered into Sana'a uh, then, and, and began uh, making noises and, and, mm -hmm. and moves that threatened Saudi Arabia, absolutely um, that would have been one of the motivations for why the Saudis um, intervened in the conflict six months later. Um, one other point I want to bring up with you, which is when you said that there needs to be a de-escalation of tensions and there are different... Uh, uh, who would do that? Who, would play, who is playing a role in the de-escalation of sanctions? I mean, of uh, tensions. And you brought up the issue of sanctions as... Uh, uh, as sanctions against Iran as probably to sweeten the deal with Iran to right. do something on Yemen? Yeah, I, I think so. Can yourself on that? And, and again, I think that, you know, that to the extent that people are looking at ways to de-escalate tensions in the region, I think that there's been a general understanding, a general uh, perception that the low-hanging fruit in accomplishing that would be uh, resolving the conflict in Yemen, that that is the most immediate issue. It's one where Iran really does not have a strong strategic interest uh, as compared to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and therefore, if the Iranians decided that they wanted to try to be helpful in reducing tension, one easy way for them to do it, one cost-free way for them to do it, would be to be helpful in um, encouraging the Houthis 
to come back to the negotiating table and reach an agreement. To sweeten the deal for Iran. Uh, well, and, and what, what we would do to sweeten the deal with Iran would be to offer them some relief on the sanctions. All right, but I'd, I'd like that we discuss this a little bit later with everyone here because I think that this may be a bit controversial and we'll talk about it. But Skip Ghanim, um, Georgetown University, Elliot George, George School, Washington. Washington. George Washington. George Washington. Oh, what did I say? You said Georgetown, but that's okay. Right. George Washington <laughs> University, Elliott School of International Affairs, Vice Dean, Kuwait Professor of Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Affairs and Middle East Policy Forum Director, former United States Ambassador to Jordan, Australia, and Kuwait. I assume that you would want to come with your own ideas to the table rather than comment, so please go ahead and lay to us before us what, what you would like us to learn from you first before we engage in a conversation. Uh, th thank you very much. And uh, looking at the, the title that was proposed for our panel about geostrategic uh, issues uh, in the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula, the one that I focused on immediately was the situation uh, in the Gulf uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran that was really uh, underscored with the uh, attack on the Saudi oil facilities preceded, of course, by a number of other incidents, attacks on tankers, seizure, seizure of tankers, also more recently one in actually in the Red Sea, which was an Iranian tanker that came under fire. And all of this uh, represents a really deterioration, I would say, in the situation between these countries, moving them closer and closer to a more uh, military-type confrontation. Every one of the states in the region, I think, are quite fearful of things going in that direction. So uh, I was with a, a fairly large and interesting group of people, uh, one of many, along with some Saudis, some Emiratis, other Gulfs, also a number of American um, political scientists who follow the region very closely. And we were assessing this. And the conclusion that we reached, which I want to bring out to you today, was that the consequences of there not being a reaction by either the United States or Saudi Arabia to the attack on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia certainly had left the Iranians feeling that they had won, that they were now emboldened, that there was very likely to be an additional incidents of similar nature, probably all that they could deny that they were a part of, that being one of the techniques of the Iranians, and that in the absence of anything that would keep this, uh, these attacks from spiraling downwards, you were going to, in fact, have a very, very bad situation in the Persian Gulf. Now, the conclusion was that the way you stop that spiral from going downhill is to try to think of a way that you would diplomatically address the situation. The question that <clears throat> all came up with immediately, well, then you need someone to take the lead in this sort of a diplomatic effort. And who, at this point in time, actually can do that? Well, <clears throat> the Kuwaiti Emir has always has been a, a mediator and a person who's wanted to have that help, but he hasn't had much success. The Omanis are another outlier, and I say outlier in the sense that they sit at one end of the Gulf, their relationship with Iran is well known. They're not actually going to be one that's going to be able to convince uh, certain other parties to come to any diplomatic setting. And of course, the Saudis and Emiratis are not likely to. Now, I realize there may be some talks going on behind the scene, but the United States is also no longer in the position of taking a lead for such an effort. Uh, we're very much discredited in the region, and I think that that was reinforced by our failure to in any way respond to the security commitment that everyone in the region believed we had towards Saudi Arabia. And so the question then is, so Skip, where are you going with all of this? If you just now dismissed everybody as having an ability to, to uh, open up a diplomatic front. And I have a suggestion, which was something we were asked to try to think of. There is an institution uh, in New York, the United Nations, where inside the United Nations, <clears throat> There is an often a use of something called the Friends of. And this was used very successfully with Afghanistan, Friends of Afghanistan. And what does this mean? Uh, this means that in at the UN setting, but not the UN officialdom, that you then have a, a, a room that's closed in which the parties interested to the dispute can come 
even though they don't have diplomatic relations, don't talk to each other, there in that setting, you can have a conversation. With Afghanistan, it led to some breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. So what I'm proposing is that the parties that are rather intractable at if, if the moment could actually agree to meet in this Friends of the Gulf setting in which you could talk about the issues. I don't think it will lead to a comprehensive settlement of all the issues in the Gulf, but if it can touch on some of the momentary major crises and lead to a back off of the situation that we are really facing today, that would at least be a positive step in the direction of dealing with the problems. A couple of follow-up questions. Uh, you spoke of uh, your fear, basically, of the Iranians being too emboldened because of the n lack of response. Uh, there is talk that uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards are really thinking that they would hit again in the same, on the same level, let's say, in a couple of weeks, actually if they do not get released from sanctions. So um, what happens from your point of view if the Iranians dare and do another attack such as the one on the oil facilities in Saudi Arabia? Well, that's exactly the fear that the group I was talking about uh, uh, held in quite, quite considerable depth, actually, that there would be another uh, attack, whether it's the Revolutionary Guard or another faction from within Iran, though they're the most obvious ones. To All right, so take what action. to do about it? Well, the point is, is that the, when that happens, then the, the victims, whether it's the Saudis, us, or another party, uh, are under more pressure to actually react in a strong way, which I think they may well do the next You think time. the U.S. would react militarily in response, or would it be still sanctions, tighten the sanctions? Well, I can only give you my personal opinion okay. on this one, is that Jeez. we have pushed sanctions to, to real limits. And they have had some significant effect, but the Iranians have learned to live with sanctions for a long time. Mm. And I don't think there's anything else more we can do vis-a-vis -vis sanctions mm -hmm. that will stop that kind of behavior. Myself, so, that's my personal view. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. Go ahead. But whether the United States, uh, the president, is the, going to be the decision maker, as has been very, very clear recently, yeah. uh, will uh, be willing to take uh, tougher action uh, is actually beyond my ability to comprehend. Uh, I'm sorry to surprise you, Tim Linder King, but I'm going to ask your opinion on that. You are in the administration. I need your view on this because this is a, a policy uh, yeah. issue and we need to hear from you. Thank you and, and good afternoon to, to everybody. I, I like the strategic restraint that has been shown by the United States and by the Gulf countries in not responding to a very provocative attack uh, on Upcake. Um, really, you know, striking the Saudi heartland in a sense, the oil platform there, um, largest oil fields. Uh, certainly, uh, we had a, an opportunity uh, and a justification to respond a couple of months earlier when our UAV had been shot down. Um, and that was just before Secretary Pompeo went to the region, and what he heard from the Gulf partners was, we really appreciate and are relieved that the president did not retaliate. Gulf countries, it won't surprise anybody, are uh, afraid of being hit. Um, they have uh, vulnerabilities uh, that, um, that their leadership is very aware of. And I think our sense is that if we were to attack Iran or respond in some way to the attack on Saudi Arabia, there would be a response in the Gulf. And then we're into an escalation that I think we have to be extremely careful about embarking on because that we're not there yet. Uh, and I wouldn't minimize um, the situation in the Gulf and the, uh, the highly um, tense and dangerous situation that, that prevails there. But I think once we go kinetic against the Iranians, I think it's a new ball game. So I think we have to be extremely careful um, before we do that. <coughs> I do believe that there, is, there are more sanctions coming down the road. Um, I say that because not every avenue of income that the Iranians have has been closed off. Uh, obviously, they're legitimate transactions, but not every uh, sanctioned, sanctionable activity has been stopped. So I think the sanctions are likely to get tighter before they get looser. I think the question that we're all trying to get to is at what point can we 
get around a table with the Iranians. And, you know, from my point of view inside the administration, I feel that there have been very clear signals that we are prepared to do that anytime, any place, no conditions. Um, the Iranian response to that has been an inadequate mm -hmm. um, and to some extent provocative. I'd love to see, and I think the president would as well, the secretary would love to see that situation change. And I don't think there's any intention to relieve the pressure until we get to the point where we are talking together. And just to push you on this point further, if you permit me, um, the issue is that if Iran feels emboldened and if they do another attack, are you, try, are you saying that uh, the response, a similar response of the past is to be repeated? You don't think that's going to require any other response uh, and because you feel that the sanctions are good enough, whatever they do? Or I just, want you to, I just want you to be clear on this one because I don't want us to misunderstand you. Yeah, I mean, I can't read what's going on in the mind of the Iranian leadership. No, I'm talking about the U.S. leadership. The, the pressure is definitely there. It's being felt. I don't think there's, um, there's a desire on the part of our leadership to strike Iran. I think, again, there were pretexts to do that. We didn't do it. I'm glad we didn't. I think the Gulf countries are glad we didn't. I'm not dismissing Ambassador Ghanim's point, because I do think it's important. The Iranians do respond to force, or shows of response, uh, force. And I do think it is our goal to have a deterrent capacity in Saudi Arabia. Clearly, that was not achieved with the initial flow of forces into Saudi Arabia. So we're putting more forces there. And the idea is to uh, you know, create a very strong message that Saudi Arabia and indeed the Gulf are off limits mm -hmm. uh, to to Iranian to further Iranian uh, military provocation. Uh, I, because I ambushed you, I didn't mean to skip you. Excuse me, I don't mean to skip you. I got back to you, but because I ambushed you, would you want to say anything as an, as an opening statement? Uh, Timothy Linder King. Um, I would just add three points that I don't think have been made so far that I think are important when we talk about the dynamics of the Gulf. Number one is the uh, very dynamic change that is going on inside the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia that is led by the Crown Prince. Uh, I think whatever you you know feel about some of the decisions that he's been made on other issues, the change is real. It's beneficial. Uh, I think the Saudi population, by and large, is responding very positively to it. As a traveler to Saudi Arabia over the last uh, six years and as someone who lived in Riyadh, I can see the change uh, for, for my very eyes, and I think it's a positive one. And I think that the region is going to benefit from the opening inside Saudi Arabia. Most of us have felt it's long overdue, and I think it's going to benefit the region, the Gulf region, and the broader Middle East. Number two. Uh, look at the uh, closer relations between Israel and the Gulf. Uh, I think that that is something that, that needs to be considered when we talk about, in the, particularly in the context of Iran, there's a more common set of enemies now than, than the Gulf had felt before. And then the third is what's been interesting to me is how much our diplomacy with the Gulf countries now involves discussions about the outer, uh, outer edges of the Gulf, Somalia, uh, Libya, of course, Sudan. We have a special envoy for Sudan. Spends a lot of time in Khartoum. Spends a lot of time in Abu Dhabi. Spends a lot of time in Riyadh. And so those of us who have been working on the Gulf um, are you know, trying to develop our expertise in some of these other issues. And that, that's a reflection of the fact that the Gulf is expanding, particularly the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but other, other countries too. You could cer certainly look at Qatar expanding their reach uh, with their wealth and, and, and trying to influence uh, the developments in other countries that are, are normally outside their, their domain. Is that good or bad, Timothy? Well, it's good if, 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 if it's coordinated with us. Uh, we don't want the countries, I mean, these are sovereign countries. They have their own foreign policy. They have the right to pursue their own interests. But we have strong interests in how uh, the evolution of Sudan takes place, for example, with this opportunity now with a, a civilian government and prime, prime minister who's, uh, whom, whom we're working with. Um, and so we want to work very closely. We, we're not in favor of countries going off and doing their own thing. Uh, we want to be coordinated with the Gulf on these other issues.
Thank you very much. I will introduce you now <coughs> properly. Um, and then uh, this was Mr. Timothy Linder King, U.S. Department of State, Bureau of Eastern of Near Eastern Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Arabian Gulf Affairs, former U.S. Department of State, Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And we will get back to you, of course. And I want you to speak about, uh, of course, Lebanon as another sphere of influence. Um, I will now go to Dr. Abdullah Baboud, a National University of Singapore Middle East Institute visiting professor, former Qatar University Gulf Studies Center director, former University of Cambridge uh, Gulf Research Center director. Please uh, tell us what you're bringing to the table and before we open it for a further discussion. Um, thank you, uh, Raghida, and uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, uh, everybody, and thanks for the National Council for the invitation and uh, my good friend, John Dio Cantini for his uh, courtesy and always a pleasure to be here. Well, um, it's difficult to come up with something new after we've been through some uh, very two long days of uh, deliberation. Um, however, what I'd like to say is uh, this. Uh, the Gulf states, as you all know, and many of you have traveled there and been there, are um, rich states. Um, they are, uh, you know, they are the states that are basically uh, because of uh, uh, the oil wealth. Um, you know, they have been seeing lots of development, economic development, social development, uh, political development, etc. Um, these states, while they are doing that, they are almost like um, islands in a very rough sea of uh, hungry and angry people. And basically, um, here you have a very wealthy, a prosperous state, but around them, the whole region is in turmoil. And I don't think it takes anyone uh, uh, clever to understand that you can never guarantee your stability and security when you live in that rough sea. And this is where the Gulf states are, um, are at the moment. So um, that, keeping that in mind, I think we also have to uh, consider what we've just heard uh, throughout the days and the deliberations, that the challenges that these states are facing are enormous, despite all the wealth. We are seeing economic challenges because of the oil prices uh, changes. Uh, and because of the geopolitical, uh, 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 if you like, consideration of the oil, uh, on, on oil, uh, we are seeing also changes uh, in terms of, or challenges in terms of finding employment for the young educated people that they, are, um, uh, that they have uh, uh, brought up. We are seeing challenges in terms of social cohesion. We are seeing challenges in terms of environment. We are seeing challenges in terms of uh, security and stability uh, in the region. It cannot continue, this, these, these islands of prosperity, they cannot continue in isolation from uh, the, the, the larger environment. I mean, all you have to do is look around you, if you live in the Gulf, and see what's going on. Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Somalia, Sudan, uh, Lebanon, Iraq. The whole region is in turmoil, and the Gulf states cannot just think that they can um, continue to live in the way they are if these problems around them are not resolved. That's one thing. The other thing is these islands of stability and security, at the same time, they've created their own regional integra integration, their own regional organization that has helped to a very large extent in ensuring this stability and security. However, we are also seeing cracks within that. Not because of outside making, because of their own making. Because of the GCC state themselves are creating that. Which makes it difficult for them to face these challenges on one hand, but it also makes it more difficult for them to, uh, for their international partners uh, to, to, uh, to help them if uh, and when, when they wanted to. Um, so that is another, uh, if you like, a, a challenge that we've done. Uh, to ourselves. I, I would also just add something about, uh, I know you want sorry. to stop me. No, no, no I'm sorry, no, um, I want to stop you. About, uh, about you. Yemen. That's all. <laughs> um, obviously, from day one, it was obvious that there was no military solution to the war in Yemen. Mm -hmm. 
And the cost of that war in human uh, uh, toll and also in terms of financial uh, cost, that could have been a Marshall Plan to transform the whole region. And this is what the region needs. It needs a, 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 a Marshall Plan to transform the region and to move beyond the existing animosity, the existing uh, uh, conflicts that we have to a different level of cooperation and integration and also of learning how to exist with each other. We cannot, and, and, and we, we cannot destroy Iran, and Iran cannot destroy us. Iran is a neighboring country. We've got to live, we've got to learn how to live with that. Yes, we have issues with Iran. Yes, we have uh, 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 issues with our neighbors. But we can't mm -hmm. let that go beyond the normal diplomatic ways of trying to uh, find ways to uh, resolve our own conflict in a more peaceful and civilized way. Mm. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Let me try to do this now by fine tuning some of what uh, uh, was said. And I'd, maybe I should take it region by region. Let me do Yemen first. Uh, Timothy Linder King, do you think uh, what was proposed by uh, Jerry Feierstein, Feierstein, sorry, I have to say it, sorry, for Feierstein, um, do you think what was said by him uh, about sweetening the deal for Iran to do, to deliver on Yemen is something this administration would think about by lifting sanctions? Or partial sanctions, or by telling the, the Europeans to, to not to the Europeans to go ahead and provide the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the way out uh, through, you know, bailout, limited bailout? Uh, our view is that Iran doesn't have any constructive role to play in Yemen, and they're not playing any constructive role. On the other hand, they're playing a destructive role. Uh, they have... Uh, you know, armed and trained the Houthis in a in a in a counterproductive way. Uh, I, I, you know, living in Riyadh, we used to explain to visiting congressmen that that Yemen is as important to Saudi Arabia as Mexico is to the United States. It's a long, uh, it's a cont contiguous country. It's a long border. Uh, the border is very rugged. Things move uh, on a good day across that border uh, that include drugs. On a bad day, it's terrorists and weapons and you know other other problems. So um, I think Americans sometimes are, are uh, loath to understand how important Yemen is to Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, the fact that Saudi Arabia is getting hit on has been up until uh, the last couple of weeks been hit on a fairly regular basis missiles and. UAVs, airports being struck, um, you know, numerous times. I do think that um, there may come a point at which uh, Iran may choose to play a more constructive role. I think that we saw that in December in Sweden in the talks uh, in which the Houthis and the Yemeni government participated. There was very good progress that was made there. It was very good inter interaction between the, the various parties involved. I was, uh, I was there with our ambassador to Yemen and saw that firsthand. We had very good in interactions uh, with the Houthis at that, at that time. Things did not go well afterwards. Uh, the uh, things that were agreed to did not happen. So, I do think, you know, to, to, get, to the, um, get to the point, I think that eventually there may be a time in which Iran could be brought into the conversation. I do not believe that time is now. But we thought we did. Uh, we heard that the U.S., that the administration was speaking um, about Yemen from the point of view of how to bring Iran into the conversation. This did not go anywhere? No, it, it's not. It, it's not. It, it's premature, I would say. Now, um, if the Iran, it, getting back to the point I made earlier about Iran coming to the table, that would be a welcome thing. And I think that conversation would likely focus on the sanctions, not on Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not encouraging the UN envoy to march off to Tehran and start consulting with the Iranians. I think we need to see that Iran is willing to play a positive role uh, before we would uh, uh, build a dialogue with them on Yemen. Jerry Feinstein, you heard the answer. So, uh, <laughs> and Skip the name come in afterwards. Uh, so what, you know, you, you guys are talking about something going on maybe behind the scenes and some others playing a role to, 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 to get this, uh, to kickstart a certain process. You heard it clearly from Timothy Linder King. What do you say now? 
Well, I, I, I certainly would never ever think of uh, disagreeing with my friend Tim Wenderking. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you know, I just got you too. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I just got you. Too. <laughs> um, uh, here's the thing, you know, and and uh, I, I think that Tim is right. I mean, he's certainly right about the way he has uh, portrayed Iran's role in this Yemen conflict until now. And the issue is, uh, I think as Tim said, you know, at the right moment, uh, the, it may be appropriate to, uh, to reevaluate the, uh, the way we're um, uh, looking at Iran and looking at Iran's potential as a constructive versus destructive uh, element. And the question would be is whether we are at that moment now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, there are several things. I mean, one is, uh, that the uh, the idea of some kind of a dialogue between the Gulf states, particularly the Emiratis in Iran, is um, one of the more open secrets in the world right now. On Yemen, let's stay with me on Yemen. They're well, not, they well, about but Yemen? but I suspect that Yemen is part of the conversation. Okay. Um, there uh, is certainly some uh, reason to believe that the Iranians are quietly encouraging the Houthis uh, to. Um, to de-escalate their own uh, conflict with Saudi Arabia, that some of the positive elements of what we've seen in the last few days and weeks uh, in terms of uh, Saudi Houthi dialogue are in fact taking well, well, what, place with the encouragement of Iran. Well, what, what, tell, us, tell us about that. I have, well, I'm not well, aware uh, of the such uh, thing. Well, uh, tell again, us about. This is, uh, it's not a secret. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that the Houthis declared that they were not going to uh, fire um, uh, missiles or, or um, uh, into Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudis have uh, responded by saying that they would suspend uh, air attacks in, in Yemen. And that seems to be holding. So who's the, who's, who's the facilitator of this? Well, the Saudis and the, and the Houthis. I mean, you know, frankly speaking, there's no requirement for a facilitator. The Saudis and the Houthis know how to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. They've been talking to one another for probably a thousand years. Um, and so, uh, and so uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that there have been off and on uh, conversations. Uh, I think that the conversations are on again. And they are showing some sign of, uh, of uh, progress. And uh, I believe that the Iranians are certainly encouraging the Houthis along those lines. Skip, what do you know about that? Well, I don't know really much at all about the talks going on mm -hmm. behind the scene. But I agree really with Jerry uh, uh, that it, it, they do go on. They, they do have a relationship of sorts. They know how to d discuss it with each other. But I just would want to emphasize once more something that Jerry said earlier on, because I think we in the United States simply don't grasp that the problems in Yemen are domestic internal issues. So one could then say that even if you get the outsiders out, which is, of course, a pretty hypothetically strange thought, that you're still going to have to reconcile mm -hmm. uh, the, the Zaydis in the north with the Shafais in the middle and the Southerners in the south who have real grievances with each other. And mm -hmm. um, there was a big effort, as you know, diplomatically. Jerry was very active and engaged in that uh, earlier mm -hmm. uh, that, that collapsed when people couldn't reconcile. Abdullah, you want to say anything about Yemen uh, before I move on to other things? Other, I like, I mean, I, I heard you when you said the Marshall Plan. I understand. And that is important. When would that, I mean, basically, are you saying it should happen before or as part of reaching an agreement, so as, 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 as part of, of, of uh, facilitating uh, a resolution or thereafter? Uh, in a way to, uh, of answering your question, uh, uh, Raida, if I may. I think we have to think and ask ourselves a question. Uh, and I want you to think about this. Who do you think the Houthis would want to have partnership with after uh, in, in a post-war Yemen? Just ask yourself a question. Is it going to be Iran or Saudi Arabia or the Gulf states or the United States? I think it doesn't, you don't need to think very hard about it. <laughs> Ira, uh, Yemen in a post-war Yemen needs development and needs a lot of money, the Marshall Plan, if you like. And that Marshall Plan is certainly not going to come from Iran. It's going to come from the region, 
and it's going to come from international partners. And I think the Houthis are very desperate. We, and somehow, in our own way, trying to push them towards uh, uh, Iran and label them with Iran. Of course, there were some Iranian uh, uh, support, but it's over, over exaggerated to explain some uh, 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 of the reasons for the war. Mm -hmm. However, I think they really need to talk to Saudi Arabia, and I think they are, I agree with you, they are talking already, as far as uh, we hear from some reports, they're already talking uh, to the Saudi government, mm -hmm. and I think there are some or, uh, understanding that has been reached, and I believe this could go a long way uh, in the future of de-escalating, moving towards uh, uh, maybe accepting the Houthis, as uh, you know, uh, power in the ground. Mm. Unfortunately, now after the war, they could have they could have agreed before uh, uh, the start of the war uh, for you know a less role. I think now they feel empowered, mm. and they feel and I think their demands are going to be uh, high, and we're going to pay the cost for yeah. that. I'm I'm not so sure. I and I agree with you that it uh, that the resolution of Yemen is doable without Iran being a central part of it, and I seem. To hear you saying that, I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's true, but uh, I want to move on to Iran, and you could tell me if you okay. think so uh, uh, in the process of answering about Iran. I have several questions here, and I just read them, and what I want to do is to, uh, I understood them, and I'm going to include them in the conversation, if that's okay, rather than going question as is, just for the flow of the conversation, if, with your permission, but... I read and, and I, get, I get your point, so I thank you for contributing to it. Uh, to me, Cylinder King was very clear. The US has been saying to the Iranian uh, leadership, come talk, and the Iranian leadership is saying, no, no, we won't. They are the ones who are putting the conditions on uh, having a conversation. And it seems that the Revolutionary Guards, who are the active uh, rulers right now, decision makers in Tehran, are becoming more um, cornered and therefore their, their, the level of their threats is getting higher and they may be uh, on the verge of having uh, further operations. Uh, so they basically are sending a message that if you want to talk to someone, we are the correct address, not the Rouhanis of the world or the, uh, the Jawaz Zarifs. Uh, in the civilian government. So is there a possibility that uh, a conversation could go on with uh, revolutionary guards, although they are listed uh, uh, by the State Department, I think, as a terrorist uh, um, entity? Is there any possibility to talk to them, Timothy Linder King? Or uh, uh, if you don't talk to them, what happens next? How do you read what Iran is up to next? We haven't dictated who the Iranians would bring to the table. That's really their call. I think we're eager to do that. I think it would be very positive for the region. Uh, I don't know what other signals that we might send um, other than the very, very clear ones uh, that we have sent about our keenness to, to, to dialogue. Again, I would point to the fact that there has been restraint exercised on our part and not retaliating against some very significant provocations, uh, a direct strike from Iran on, uh, on Saudi Arabia, then blamed on the Houthis. Very curious. Um, the Houthis had nothing to do with that attack. So I consider that, the way I read that, was rather a, an arrogant blunder on the, part of the, uh, on the part of the Iranians, thinking that they could get away with that. Um, and we saw through it very quickly. I think the, Houth the Houthis may have seen through it uh, quite quickly as well. Um, so, did you again, just say that? You, did you just answer my question when I asked you about your willingness to sit with the revolution, to, to, to talk with the revolutionary guards? Did I just hear you say you're willing to sit with them? I said we are willing to talk to you know the Iranians who come to the table. Really? Yeah. Despite the fact that I you, don't believe there's been any proclamation from our leadership on the American side saying who it has to be. The call is there, the door is open, let the Iranians walk through it. So even though they are I don't on think we're checking names at the door and, and all of that. I mean, bring, bring them forward. Even though they are on your terrorist... They are a designated terrorist organization for good reason. Oh my God, I hope there's some journalists in here. This is big news. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do you think about that, Skip? 
Well, let's just say that if it was Suleimania who was the one who walked through the door, I'm yeah. not Qasim so Suleimani. certain. Qasim Suleimani, you mean? Yes. Yes. I'm not so certain that we would be very happy and would be willing to sit down at the table. But I do hear what uh, what Tim is saying, and I'm not trying to contradict him. I think the administration is actually made a very bold pronouncement, and they did it for strategic, diplomatic, and political reasons, which was to make us look reasonable and the other party unreasonable. That's not uh, an unheard of diplomatic ploy. Mm, interesting. I did say ploy. Ploy. Skipranims calls it a ploy, Jerry. Well, I, I hope that Tim is right. Uh, you know, there's, uh, <laughs> there's nothing more you can say. Uh, I think it was an unfortunate uh, decision to, to, um, to sanction IRGC as an entity because my experience is that it actually does make things much more complicated to try to talk to them. Uh, but if a decision is made uh, that, that we're not going to uh, check names at the door, I think that's, a, that's the right decision, it's a good move, and um, we should uh, welcome it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Abdullah, what? Shall I have a, a little bit more controversial? Uh, yes, well, uh, I'd like it. Listen, this is very good so far. <laughs> I, uh, I'm the, the only non-American on uh, this panel. Maybe I should have a, a different view, if you like. I think the you United States... You don't have States, to. It's not uh, obligatory. Okay. No, I, I want to. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great chance. I think, um, I, think we, uh, I think we have to remember that the United States has walked out unilaterally from a multilateral uh, uh, agreement, uh, the GCPOA. And I think they now feel, probably, they made a mistake and they want Iran to come back and, and talk to them, so they'll open the doors and not check the names. But what they have really forgotten, what the United States and a friend uh, that we look at uh, is that, uh, and, and respect, is that you know, I think they have lost confidence with the Iranians. They're, they're not willing to come and talk. Uh, because, you know, what kind of confidence that, does this give to the other side, to the Iranians, when you just walk out from uh, an, an, a multilateral agreement that you have signed and, and, you know, the other partners are sticking to it? I think the United States have to change the way that they want uh, 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 to talk. And I don't think the Iranians are just ready for... Uh, and you, uh, a photo op uh, with, uh, with, with Trump. Uh, and you don't think that the Iranians should change their behavior regionally? You don't I think, think that the do. Iranians I, should... But just to, to finish the question, you yeah. don't think the Iranian raison d'etre of having their right to expand outside their borders, borders should change? Don't you think that? Uh, of course. I, I, that. I don't necessarily... That doesn't necessarily agree with their policies in, in, in the region. And, and as I said, we have issues with the Iranian policies. But I'm talking about the specific agreement that it was signed uh, 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 multinationally with uh, P5 plus one. And I think that was, uh, it's actually, it raises a lot of questions mm. whether Iran really wants to, to do this. And I think just imposing sanctions is not necessarily going to make uh, Iran uh, uh, capitulate. Uh, and maybe they're going to you know, push it more towards uh, escalation, which nobody really wants uh, to do. They feel strangled at the moment. Skip. Well, I, I just want to say, uh, poor Abdullah, to be stuck up with three Americans here, all of us diplomats. But look, when it comes right down to it, if you look at some of the narratives that have been out there in the last month or two, you've seen some interesting comments from Iranian officials about suddenly there are some things that they said they would never, ever discuss. They are saying, well, you know, that's not beyond the scope of what, what, conversation. What, 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 I mean, I'm really surprised. What do you, where are you gentlemen seeing this? I, I, I mean, I follow I'm not this privy, every single day. I'm not privy I'm not, to the uh, top secret uh, the documents of the U.S. government anymore, but it's reported in the press uh, by quotes uh, by Iranian officials. That uh, what? Go have, ahead. Yes, who have said. So what I'm really... That what? what? What is a quote? My sense of it is that the Iranians are, in effect, projecting a slightly more flexible Position. Conditional, if I may add, right. it is conditional of course, on the release. Of course, it will be conditional. It's, this is conditional on the uh, uh, release from sanctions. This is conditional on selling oil, their oil. That's what they're saying. It's not they're saying we will come to the table and talk. They're saying let the Europeans deliver, 
we want to sell 100 million barrels a day, and then we will think about where we go from there. Well, no, or not, am I wrong, Timothy? That's not quite, that's not quite correct. Okay, I think good. that what, what, if you go back and look at what happened in New York, um, at the uh, effort that uh, Emmanuel Macron made to, uh, to arrange for an, a, a communication between President Rouhani and President Trump, uh, the issue was uh, only who walked through the door first. It was not um, uh, a disagreement on the nature of what was on the other side of the door. Uh, and, so, uh, and so the fact of the matter is that both the U.S. and Iran have signaled that they would be willing to engage on a conversation um, with the understanding that there would be sanctions relief. And the only question was, does the sanctions relief come before the uh, meeting, or does it come after the meeting? Timothy, let's go to the source here. Can you set the record straight since we're talking? I mean, I, I wouldn't say more than what has been said. I would just, uh, you know, repeat that um, when our overtures have been made, they have not been responded to in a favorable way. And uh, I mean, all, all we can do is is keep the door open and and. Uh, you know, encourage the Iranians to walk through it. Uh, and I think that's the way you get into all the issues on the table. Um, you know, the, the, the Jikpoa, um, uh, one of the flaws with that whole engagement there was that it didn't deal, it, it didn't get at the issue of Iran's behavior in the region. And that was, dis, you know, highly dissatisfying to our Gulf partners. And as a result, uh, I mean, I know that we um, talked to uh, the Gulf about, you know, getting into that conversation about Iran's behavior, but it, 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 it hasn't happened. And so uh, Iran has continued and even escalated, um, you know, it, it's more malign activity, I would say, in the region. So whether you're looking at, um, you know, Iraq or Syria or Lebanon or Yemen being the, you know, sort of the four hot spots. Uh, they're as active as ever, if not more. Mm -hmm. and so that, that, I think, is really the heart of the issue, is, is the, that is, in our view, a destabilizing uh, effort, the relationship that they have with Assad, the relationship they have with militias do, in Iraq. Do, I mean, do you are, think they are weakened in their regional aspirations because of the sanctions? Or, for example, I'll take Lebanon and the relationship with Hezbollah. Uh, do you think that the Iranians, are, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is weaker in uh, its uh, regional ambitions now because of the sanctions? I think. Or the, uh, not? I think the ambitions are still there. I don't see any. Uh, we don't see any change in their ambitions. Mm -hmm. Their ability to carry out some of those uh, uh, ambitions is highly constrained with uh, with the pressure that they're under. Take take Lebanon as an example. Are they? Restrained with their in their support to Hezbollah, Hezbollah feels that they are still ruling in Lebanon. So, how restrained are they there? I would say that um, the cash flow isn't what it used to be. That that hampers Hezbollah's activities. But in our view, Hezbollah has far too much influence in Lebanon, and it's destructive of the state and its institutions. Just, just I, 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 I just have to say this. You know, when you're in the diplomatic corps, as three of us were. Uh, Tib still is, uh, you rarely have time to kind of read back and think through things. The one thing I've learned since I've been a professor, and that's now 15 years, is to look at documents that go back to the time of the, uh, of the Iranian Revolution, and you would be a stunned at the number of U.S. documents, now declassified, in which changing the behavior of Iran was paramount objective of United States policy. Mm -hmm. And here we are, how many decades later? Four. Mm. And it's still our objective. Look, let's face it. The Iranians, the Persians, if you will, see themselves as rightful players in a region with a place that has never been accepted by others. Wait, wait. Uh, let me finish. Wait. No, you let, no, you let me finish. Okay, and, so, ahead, but and so when you look at their activities in the region, you at least have to comprehend what motivates them to do this. And I think they're opportunistic. I think they go anywhere they can go, and they look at existing situations, Yemen being the prime example of this, where they had internal difficulties, they could play for pittance and cost the Saudis billions. 
Okay. So uh, I don't I don't think that their capacity in the region is lessened very much are, are as you, a result of sanctions. Uh, Skip, let me ask you: Are you suggesting that we should accept that both people from the Arab region or the, in the United States that we should accept that Iran has the right to perform outside of its own borders in the way that it had created paramilitary forces in Lebanon through Hezbollah, intervened through Syria uh, or the Houthis in Yemen. Are you saying this is the rightful right? No, I didn't say well, that at all. Then what do you mean? I just that said that we didn't accept that, that we behavior. Need re we need to respect the fact that they are there and that they have uh, uh, their own security concerns. And in fact, the countries in the region need to understand that there has to be an arrangement amongst them that, that recognizes that. Arrangement to recognize what? That they uh, have the right to have paramilitary forces in uh, sovereign states? I didn't say that. Well, then explain what you said. I said that they uh, have a reason for being engaged in the region, whether it be economics and trade and politics, and that is going to happen no matter what we do and others, but, mm -hmm. but, but what they are doing now is not acceptable, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me just move on because I, uh, this, is, this is almost an hour of fantastic conversation and I think I do have a little bit more time no, assigned to me, thank you. Um, so let, let me, um, let me take, Stop a little bit because the prototype of, of Iranian success is really Hezbollah in Lebanon. This is mm -hmm. the big accomplishment of the regime. So can we just quickly a touch on, because there is there's a big event for events uh, taking place in Lebanon. Can I take your opinion uh, quickly, all of you, as to how do you view what's going on and what should be done about it? I, okay, of course, I'm referring to the wonderful, uh, from my point of view, uh, the events of people <coughs> going on the street to claim their rights. However, the issue of Hezbollah control is still right there and behind the scenes and in the face of all those people who want change. That's where I'm approaching this. Go ahead, Jerry. No, I, I would say I think that your, uh, your, your point is absolutely correct, Raghav, and I think that one of the things that people are looking at, what is different about Lebanon today, as opposed to where Lebanon has been in the past, is one, the fact that the, um, that the demonstrations, the protest movement, is um, not confessionally based. It goes across all of the confessions in, in Lebanon. Everybody's out on the street together. And the other thing that's extremely interesting about this is that perhaps for the first time, um, criticism of Hezbollah is on the table. Uh, and the fact is that, that people are willing to stand up at this point and say, Hezbollah, you bear responsibility along with everybody else for everything that's gone wrong, with everything that's wrong with the government of Lebanon, <laughs> with everything that's wrong with the economy. And this is a, a new and, and extremely important, I think, um, a change in the way Lebanon has, uh, is uh, being played. <clears throat> the issue, you know, right now we have a protest movement which is uh, basically demanding that they want a new government. And that's a good thing. Uh, I don't think that anybody can, can disagree with them about, about the, the need for a new approach, whether it's technocrats or, or whoever uh, might come in. The issue, though, is have they thought through what the implications have, uh, would be? What if this government goes? What if Saad Hariri goes? What if General Alwin goes? Um, what is it that would replace it? And, and that part of the conversation is as important. And I can say from my experience uh, in, in Yemen in, during the Arab Spring there, <clears throat> that, that where these um, popular protest movements have failed is their inability to think through those questions. Mm -hmm. and, and the understanding that if they do succeed in forcing the, um, the collapse of a government, They've also got to think about how they succeed in organizing the day the day after. Yeah, Skip, do you want do you want to just? Take well, I I think Jerry's absolutely I, dead, mm -hmm. go ahead. Dead, dead right about this issue of the protest movements. But what fascinates me at the moment is that you see in Lebanon, you see it in Algiers, you see it um, in what was the third country we were, I was talking about earlier? Lost Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia and all. What you see is the, the public is fed up 
with their economic situation, the dominance of, of authoritarian forces, uh, and then the inability to deal with the corruption issue. Yeah. And this is what set off what we labeled an Arab Spring, which was suppressed in some ways because of exactly what uh, Jerry said. But I said then, and I'll say it today, that did not kill the desire of the populations in the region for a better life under it's a better government. It's a different situation in Lebanon. If you, you cannot compare it to what happened in the Arab Spring because it's a different situation. You have multiple every, every layers. Every country is different. Yeah, but, exactly. So but. it's not, it's not uh, the Arab Spring continued. It's not. Right now, I if mean, it is, it is an uprising against, against the status quo and against corruption, but the, the elephant in the room is Hezbollah and its military might within the country, state within a state. So this is an, the what, elephant What in the I room. see in the newspapers is an attack on all of the old oligarchs mm -hmm. and families who have maintained power, built their wealth, and the street wants it to change. Right. Abdullah? Um, well, I, I think any uh, uh, armed movement with, uh, inside the state um, is, is, is wrong, of course. This is, uh, has been a, a history of, uh, of uh, the weak Arab states that we are say, uh, seeing, and uh, some of them are failing Arab states. So whether it's Hezbollah or whether it is uh, other groups in Iraq or, uh, or, uh, or in, in uh, Libya or so on, uh, this is an epitome of how the state has become so weakened that other groups have started to take uh, their, their uh, uh, occupy that space. And I think Leb Lebanon by itself is, of course, a very good example of this. And it's not just Iran that interferes there. It's the whole region. It's the whole world. Lebanon is basically where everybody plays their dirty, uh, 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 their dirty politics. And Iran has, of course, uh, found uh, uh, its way because of so many fault lines that happens within, you know, within, uh, within Lebanon. And I think this is something that we really now need to think about and you know, not just kind of focus on the small picture, but look at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bigger picture is that we have weak, failing states, and, and then on one hand, and they're not able to uh, either deliver uh, on you know their political, economic, and social uh, uh, um, uh, uh, demands, but for, for the people, at the same time you have a young people that are resisting this and resisting the old uh, mm -hmm. uh, elite, uh, as it were. And the Arab Spring is not is going to come in so many different ways and shapes. It's not necessarily what happens in Lebanon. It's not necessarily an Arab Spring. But I don't think uh, the Arab Spring is just a slogan. There are people who's happening. Is we've seen it in Iraq. We've seen it in in, in in Sudan. We've seen it in Tunisia. So I think the people, the young people now, who are mostly 50% of the Arabs are under uh, uh, 25 years old. They haven't. Um, kind of experienced the, uh, the, 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 the past history that we, uh, we have seen. They want a better life. They, are, they can't just run away from their own countries and, and, and risk their lives to Europe. They want to live in their own countries and they want a better mm -hmm. government. And they're, gonna, they're going yeah. to revolt one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Timothy, what is the U.S. policy on what's going on now in Lebanon? I think, from, you know, from our point of view, we see a genuine uh, outpouring uh, in, in on the streets in Lebanon. In, in some ways, it's a surprise that it's taken this long because things have been deteriorating for some time. Uh, as I would see, you know, see it, the stranglehold of Hezbollah has, has gotten stronger. Um, there is a legitimate issue, uh, as Skip noted, of corruption. I think that features in each of these sets of street demonstrations, whether it's Iraq or, or Algeria, um, people are tired of, of the uh, inefficiencies, the inability to get things done, poor services, unresponsive government. So uh, we we see you know some legitimate aspirations there that are that are being expressed, and we would um, you know take with a lot of concern any sort of harsh measures that that governments would take to crack down on would, on these uh, aspirations. You would explain that last point. Best to address them. 
Ex explain that last point about measures to crack down. What? Well, we've seen, you know, you go back to the Khartoum example in, in, in June, and there was a very heavy response from the Sudanese government. It cost them a, at the end of the day. They killed 100 people. Um, that's, that's not, you know, that, that's not in keeping with the, tr with the trend here that I see in the region where there are legitimate aspirations being expressed and governments, rather than cracking down, which will gen is, is likely to go badly, mm -hmm. um, would do well to respond. But what the message to the army is, in that case, to so the Lebanese army would be? I mean, the message to the Lebanese army is, is to, to let the people express their will. Let people express their word? Will. Their will. Their will, OK. Yes. OK. Um, let me Provided move on. Provided it's done nonviolently. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not calling for, you know, street fires and, you know, rough behavior. Okay. And, and so far, these demonstrations have been, have been nonviolent in general. I want to put to, to the table before I, so that I could benefit from the, the, what's on people's minds here and also the time that we have left. I want to address two things. Um, one is what you spoke of proxy wars, but you also spoke of of, of proxy competitions. In effect, uh, uh, this is very interesting since we're talking about you know, the Gulf states uh, and Iran and Turkey competing, if you will, in areas such as Somalia, such as Libya, such as, and, and to each uh, their own priority, including, for example, why would Turkey be very strong? Why would Turkey play a very strong role in Libya? Uh, this is the project of the Muslim Brotherhood. Is it uh, how, how strong? Uh, how strongly are they going to be pursuing that when uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, feels rather emboldened these days and feels that he's in good place with President Donald Trump and he's coming here? So, how is that? Ref how will that reflect on Turkey's roles in these? Um, different proxy wars if they're taking place from, again, from Somalia to, uh, there's the competition and there's the wars in this uh, dimension. So I'd like that each of you, if you don't mind, to uh, let me know how you look at it. And then I want to move on before I forget to bring it to the table. I want to move on afterwards to the issue of how China and Russia are coming into the region strongly. And uh, uh, particularly the last trip of uh, Vladimir Putin to the, to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, because they're talking about probably um, you know, a new way of uh, filling in the gap, the absence of the United States. They, they feel that there is a, a, a sort of a withdrawal of interests, of American interests, and the redefinition also of what security um, means in the relationship a uh, new relationship between this administration and the Arab partners in the Gulf. That that definition of security is that we give the red lines, say to Iran, you do not touch our soldiers, you do not, uh, you know, uh, uh, do anything unacceptable on the nuclear. But then, when it comes to provocations against Saudi Arabia, against the United Arab Emirates, well, that is your war, not mine. You look after yourselves. You know, you you you, you protect your own back. We're not going to be in it with you. So I think maybe which one should well, let you choose one of those. Go ahead, Jerry. Just just choose one. Yeah, choose one, and then you could come to the other. Choose which one is you want to address first, and then I'll go. I could come to the next one. Well, well, let's talk about let's talk about Turkey first because um, uh, I think that uh, that that is important. It is an important part. Uh, again, I, I think that. Uh, uh, that uh, Skip and, and Abdullah and, and Tim touched on, on uh, some of the internal GCC uh, dimensions, and Turkey very much plays into that, of course, because of its relationship with Qatar. And, and as, as you said, and as we know, um, uh, some of it has to do with the ambitions uh, of Erdogan uh, and his vision of a Turkey that is once again um, a regional power. Uh, uh, and uh, and therefore to do that, and it also has to do with an ideological perspective, which is uh, the relationship uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which certainly colored uh, Turkey's uh, interest in uh, in Egypt, uh, in Libya to a certain extent, 
but but uh, but beyond that, of course, you also have an economic interest. And so uh, we talk about uh, when we talk about the Red Sea competition, uh, that really is an economic competition. The Turks have been uh, very active in Somalia, have created a very strong base for themselves in uh, in Somalia, base of support. Uh, for themselves in Somalia through their economic uh, intervention. And that has drawn, to a certain extent, a response from the UAE and from others who are, uh, who are concerned and have been uh, working to try to establish their own, uh, their own presence in, in uh, that side of the Red Sea. So, um, so all of these things are going on. It drives a lot of the internal competition within the GCC states uh, between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, uh, in particular, uh, and uh, and uh, and has also uh, drawn uh, this broader regional competition. I, I wanted to say just one thing, and it could be either in the China-Russia context or the or the GCC context. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think that we're seeing that's happening that's really important, and we've seen it over these last several years is the rise of this young generation, younger generation of leaders in, in the region. So you have Mohammed bin Salman, obviously, in Saudi Arabia. You have Sheikh Tamim in Qatar. You have uh, Mohammed bin Zayed in, in the UAE. And, and each of them, uh, I think, has a vision for the role that their countries play in the region and globally, that's very different from where the fathers and the grandfathers were. And a lot of what we're seeing in terms of these competitions, in terms of, of you know, uh, said quite correctly, you know, the engagement in Sudan and Somalia is a reflection of their sense that, that historically they have been seen as the financiers of other people's foreign policy. And that they're not willing to play that role anymore, that they want now to develop a foreign policy on their own that reflects their own vision of their country's role in the region, um, and which is you know, something that A, is inevitable, uh -huh. B, I think has something to do with, with what they have uh, seen in terms of declining U.S. engagement, declining <laughs> confidence in the U.S. umbrella um, uh, now, uh, and also um, internally a collapse within the Arab world of the traditional leadership. So the Egyptians are not playing the role they used to play. Obviously, the Syrians aren't playing the role that they used to play. <coughs> and in some ways, the Gulf states are moving into a vacuum in the Arab world uh, that exists and are exerting influence and exerting priorities for themselves that they didn't do before. And that plays into this whole issue of competition. Very interesting, very interesting. Skip to you. The question that you asked is, is a fantastic one, and it's one that one could spend hours uh, talking about, and, and Jerry has given a good uh, preliminary remark. And what comes to my mind is that we in the United States seem to forget that while we have enormous uh, ability to intrude or influence events in the region, I speak, I think immediately of our military uh, but also of our historic diplomatic role, we don't control events. Things happen in the region, and they happen in the region because of the region, because of the characters there, because of the situations in, in uh, Lebanon or in Yemen. And we have to deal with them. And uh, for me, as, as a person who had been in the Foreign Service for, for 36 years, I was very proud of the leadership role that I thought we brought mm -hmm. to the table that we talked with our friends and our allies. We tried to convince them to go a certain way, which we thought would be bring stability and progress. Uh, sometimes the words are democracy, but different words. And that we had an influence, and we were able to at least attempt to channel things in a certain direction. The decisions of the last administration and this one have withdrawn us from that role. Whether it's something as specific as pulling troops out of Syria, which is a very specific thing, or just simply not using our uh, influential ability to convince the Saudis, for example, not to go into Yemen militarily. If I just, I'm just plucking examples. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when we were not there to, to be a partner, and when these countries in the region lose confidence 
in the relationship with us, which is a security relationship, mm -hmm. then they're going to begin to take actions that they feel they have to take in their own uh, self-interest. And the next remark I've always made when I get to this point is what decisions they may take when they define what they have to do mm -hmm. is not necessarily going to be where we would want them to go in our best interest. Okay, just because this is the wrap-up uh, uh, sort of question. So you think it's when there's no danger for American interests with China and Russia coming in strongly into that region? Is it so it's, it's big enough for all to benefit, or should we stop and think about it here in the U.S.? <laughs> Uh, I think we should have been doing a lot of thinking about that here in the U.S. I don't think it's to our advantages whatsoever. Um, but now, you know, that the, the, once the Russians uh, got into the, to Syria the way they did, then confronting them, it's different if it's at the beginning when they're not there. It's quite a different one where they have troops everywhere and bases <coughs> and everything that they're established. And so uh, there's an erosion really of our presence and of our ability to deal with things as their influence in the region grows. But again, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to leave it that on that such a negative because I think we have to say that even with all that I said earlier and we've talked about, the United States is still the country that many of these nations look to for security. Mm -hmm. Even if they lose a little bit, have lost some confidence in us, vis-a-vis -vis Iran because of our not responding in a certain way, but I do agree, Tim was right. The, the Gulf states did not want necessarily to go down that road. But the truth of the matter is that uh, they still look to us. They do not see China as a substitute, and they certainly don't see Russia as a substitute for the relationship with us. Abdullah, do you feel the same way? Can you address the two points I sure. uh, put to the table, both the proxy competitions, the proxy wars, the competitions, and the Russia and China coming yeah. in, the three actually? Yeah, I also want to echo what Jerry, uh, Skib and Tim have said earlier, and uh, to say that Look, what is really happening in the region is uh, we have uh, a fall of the Arab uh, uh, order, as it were. The Arab League uh, has become very weak. And we have also seen a collapse or, uh, of, of that order that has allowed for certain interventions. And now, be, below the Arab League, we also have another sub-regional organization that has cracks at the moment, whether we like it or not, but that's the issue, and that's uh, the, the, the matter in front of us. And that order is also becoming weakened. And when you have uh, a weakened uh, uh, regional order, you are bound to have intervention uh, from other regional countries. You know, politics are, is like nature. It doesn't like vacuum. And the other thing is that has been mentioned is, you know, the traditional Arab countries like Egypt and Syria and Baghdad have become weakened. Mm -hmm. And the center of gravity has moved to the Gulf. Mm -hmm. They also moved to the Gulf at a time when you have these young, ambitious uh, uh, leaders who want to change and, 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 uh, the way that things have been done in the past by their, uh, their parents. And it came at a time where there was ambivalence from the United States mm -hmm. in terms of its policy towards the region. Mm -hmm. It's not just now, it's happened before. Uh, you know, Obama was talking about the pivot towards Asia. Um, he even said you know, that uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran have to learn how to divide the region between them or something uh, to that uh, extent. Uh, so, uh, we, we, uh, you know, these messages are actually read by the leaders in, in the region and they want to take the matters to their own hand. So, um, the other also policy that we should not, never forget is that the United States has always been asking for burden sharing in the region. So they've always been asking for the Russians and the Chinese and, uh, uh, and, and the Koreans and so on to do some burden sharing in the region. So what is wrong if these people are coming? Uh, now I'm just kind of you know, curiously putting that, uh, that question. If the United States is asking for burden sharing, well, here, here they are. Now, the Gulf leaders also um, you know, decided that they cannot rely totally on the United States. That does not to say that the United States is still uh, the most uh, strategic, important power uh, and, and uh, partner of choice to <laughs> the region. But they also want to have to buy insurance uh, uh, certificates from, from the others. So they want to have um, you know, a relationship with, with China, which you know, where the trade relationship is growing. 
uh, and their economic uh, relationship is becoming uh, deeper. But China is never going to replace the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think Russia is never uh, also is going to replace the United States. But they can see in Russia uh, uh, a strong partner that can actually stand with its uh, allies when sometimes they don't read the same thing for, uh, from the United States where uh, at times when it is needed as an ally it wasn't there. Mm. Thank you very much, Timothy. I think uh, I'm going to ask you to address the same things, the same, same three points, please. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot express only your personal point of view because we really want to hear about where this administration is going and how it's thinking and uh, what are you guys um, afraid of or comfortable with? What are the parameters? And uh, I think what you're going to tell us is going to be extremely interesting, especially after I heard that your uh, door is open for Qasem Soleimani to come in and yeah. negotiate with I you. I doubt he's going to answer the call. <laughs> yes, he will. Uh, he's, he's been wanting that. Okay, we'll see. Go ahead. Uh, I do think that um, you know the rise of the young generation of leaders is, is quite striking. They do have uh, their own visions for their own countries, their roles. Their, they're really putting their countries on the map regionally, and that can be a very positive thing. I think when we see the Gulf countries working across purposes, either against our interests or uh, against each other. The, the whole rift with Qatar, I think, is very problematic from our point of view. Uh, it's very inconvenient to have cracks in the GCC at a time when there is a big threat from the outside. These countries could benefit from pulling together. Um, there are other ways that they could uh, address their differences, uh, their concerns about Muslim Brotherhood or or the you know relations with Turkey that um, that could be done in in, in a constructive way. Um, I I do think there is uh, there clearly is great power competition. We I think as the U.S. have to be very careful uh, about opening the door to the Russians and the Chinese. I you know fully agree with the com the comments that were made earlier that we are the partner of choice for all uh, all of the certainly all of the gulf countries uh, there's no doubt about it but these are relationships that are not on autopilot they have to be managed and they have to be managed through you know personal engagement through visits um, uh, contact from our embassies etc i mean these things cannot be just left to uh, left to develop on their own and uh, they need to be need to be pursued you know very aggressively um, because it's a very dynamic and fluid and volatile situation out there. And so our presence uh, is very important. Uh, our, our, you know, the visits of, that we have of, of people to our leadership to these countries, congressmen, women, the military, um, the, cult, the whole cultural side, uh, the people to people uh, exchanges are still very important. I, I'm, you know, thrilled that there are 10 universities in Doha and Brookings and, and the Emirates, uh, NYU, and you know these kinds of things uh, are, uh, you know, show the breadth of the relationship, and those are important parts of, of building for the future. So, um, when we talk about Russia and China, and you know the telecommunications challenge that the Chinese are bringing to the table, we are warning these countries: be very careful about getting into a uh, technical relationship with the Chinese. It means you're getting into a relationship with the Chinese government in ways that you may not think, uh, or you may think are gonna be beneficial to you, but may have major costs down the road. So I think it's all part of you know, getting at the point of the importance of continued US engagement and leadership. Gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure engaging with you in a very uh, wonderful conversation.